Hello guys, Winston here. The Shape Oak 03 is an incredible value in the world of digital fabrication. For a little more than $1,000, you can get a machine in kit form that'll repeatably cut woods, plastics, and metals with precision easily within 0.01 inches and with a generous working area to boot. However, the same things that make the Shape Oak such an approachable platform can also be liabilities. Forgive me, Edward, for I am about to nitpick. In the world of machining, precision means everything. If your references or tools aren't accurate, then the things you produce won't be accurate either. Machinists are so fanatical about this that they seek to measure tolerances in tens of thousandths of an inch. That's .0001 inches. The number of degrees of freedom in the Shaboko that allow you to build it as a kit are also places where error can be introduced. In addition to the inherent limitations of its manufacturing process, here are some of the places where you could go wrong. 1. Metal bending is a relatively imprecise manufacturing process. When you fold metal, you put all sorts of strain into your part, and that can manifest itself in odd distortions. Plus, variations in material composition cause differing levels of springback, resulting in non-perpendicular bends. In my machine, I noticed that my base plates were causing my wasteboard to dip in the middle, only by a few thousandths of an inch, but it's enough to cause noticeable variations in cuts if you're machining right at the edges of your material bounds. Notice here how the holes in the middle of my MDF aren't cleanly cut, but the outside holes are. This was because I taped my workpiece to my distorted wasteboard, which introduced a sag in the middle. In woodworking, imperfections on the scale of the thickness of a sheet of paper aren't usually a big deal, but when you're cutting metal, that's a different story. 2. Bolted connections rely on through holes. Through holes are typically oversized. Oversized holes result in slop, and slop is bad. Slop can lead to parallelogramming of your base, tilting of your spindle mount, divergence of your rails, and so much more. These two sources of error are what I'll be addressing today, but you don't have to stop here in your pursuit of perfection. Now before anyone gets upset that their Shaboko doesn't come out of the box with the same tolerances as a Tormach, keep in mind that for the past two years I've been running my Shabokos with almost no special attention to detail, and I'm still able to get results I'm very happy with. And I don't have a Tormach sized hole in my wallet. That being said, a little effort on your part can go a long way towards improving the quality of your cuts on the Shape Oko. Here are the steps I took, and this is by no means a comprehensive guide to machine calibration. I consider my attention to detail to be above average at best, but you can absolutely be way more fanatical in the squaring of your machine. The only thing you'll need if you don't have one already is a dial indicator, preferably with a magnetic base. Now I started out by the book, working my way from the ground up. The first thing I did was to make sure my base was square. I measured corner to corner as best I could and tried to make the diagonals even. I loosened my wasteboard and rails, wrapped a strap around the longer diagonal, and added tension until my measurements matched within a sixteenth of an inch. Then I tightened up the wasteboard to lock the base frames relative to each other. Next, I checked for variations in depth from the front of the machine to the back. Using the slop in the base frame holes as my adjustment, I raised and lowered each end of my rails until my dial indicator was as steady as possible across the y-axis. I repeated this for both sides. It's worth mentioning that I'm making the assumption that my wasteboard isn't significantly twisted. You may want to check that your wasteboard is horizontal with a level, and make adjustments to the feet if necessary. Once I got my machine squared in the y-axis, I repeated the same process with the x-axis. This is where most people stop, and that's usually okay, but you're leaving precision on the table if you walk away. First off, I noticed variations across the width of my wasteboard, and that's probably due to the ever so slightly distorted base frame of the machine. The way around this is to face mill your wasteboard to machine level, but I don't like doing this on the stock wasteboard because it means that any material that overhangs the working area of your machine won't benefit from your meticulous surfacing. You'll be left with a 16x14 or 31x14 or 31x29 inch pocket in your wasteboard. What I like to do instead is mount an additional 3 quarter inch sheet of MDF to the wasteboard and surface that instead. That way you have a machine leveled island instead of a depression. Your work pieces can overhang the front or the sides and only ever touch the leveled surface. Let me know if you want a more detailed video about how I made this supplementary wasteboard, but I'm moving on to squaring the spindle. 
This is a step I overlooked when I first got started with CNC, but now understand the value of. Think about it this way. If your spindle is rotated around the x-axis, it's cutting with the front or back edge deeper than the other. Taking passes in the x direction, you'll end up with a stepped texture on your surface. If your spindle was rotated about the y-axis, then you'd leave a scalloped surface when you cut. Neither of these is desirable, and when you're machining metals, the imperfections can stand out in the surface finish of your cuts. How do you measure the squareness of your spindle? Well, I came across four ways. Number one, buy an obnoxiously expensive spindle square. Two, buy a test indicator and the requisite adapters to mount it in your spindle. Three, mount a dial indicator off axis. Or four, put two 90 degree bends in a coat hanger. The first option was out of my budget. The second option was annoying, but I'd do it if I had to. The third option sounded great in theory, but my dial indicator was too tall to fit under the gantry. The fourth option was just unappealing, but it was fundamentally sound, so I improved on it. This is what I came up with, a 3-inch plywood arm with two slotted holes machined in either end. Each end clamps onto a precision ground rod, aka an end mill, and it fits perfectly and solidly in your spindle. Turning the spindle by hand, you can feel or even see which way your router is rotated. I noticed that my biggest error was about the x-axis, so I loosened three out of the four screws on each end of the rail and tilted my entire gantry upwards. This got me pretty darn close to a squared spindle, and for me that was good enough, but some people might consider me lazy, and I invite you to go further. If you don't have enough slop in the x-axis rail mounting holes to perfectly square your spindle, you may want to take a drill bit to your gantry end plates and just shave off the powder coating. That should be enough to take you the rest of the way. If your spindle needs correction for y-axis rotation, you can try fiddling with the spindle mount or the alignment of the z-axis rails. Astute viewers will recognize that because of the order I did my shape oko tuning in, my supplementary wasteboard surface exhibits a slight sawtooth pattern because of my spindle's initial x-axis rotation. This meant I had to do another face milling operation after squaring the spindle in order to get a truly smooth surface. If face milling the wasteboard, then squaring the spindle, then face milling the wasteboard again seems inefficient to you, there is another option. You can measure the existing depth variations of your wasteboard and subtract out those offsets when you measure your spindle squareness. This works best for people with low profile dial indicators, but you can still use the poor man's spindle square and feeler gauges to do the same thing. Then, once you get your spindle square, you can face your wasteboard and it'll be perfectly smooth on the first try. But wait, there's more! While you have your dial indicator out, why don't you check the calibration of the stepper motors? Your machine's stock gerbil settings tell the controller that it takes 40 steps in order to pull itself 1mm, but depending on belt tension, stretch, and other factors, it could be more or less than 40 steps per millimeter. Use the dial indicator and compare how far the machine moves versus how far you told it to move. Here, I'm jogging in increments of 0.1 inches, and the machine is dead on in the X and Y axes, but I had to make a minor adjustment in the Z axis. This concludes what I consider to be reasonable attempts to square and calibrate your machine. You could run square circle diamond tests until you're blue in the face, but I think I got most of the low hanging fruit. I do welcome your feedback though, so if I missed an important step in setting up your shape oko, please drop me a comment down below. Otherwise, that's all I have for this week. Before I sign off though, I just want to mention that I'll be at the Bay Area Maker Fair in May, so if you're going to be there, shoot me a message on Twitter or something. I'd love to say hi and swap horror stories of machining mistakes or just talk about projects we're working on. I'll also be hanging out at the Carbide 3D booth randomly throughout the day. Thank you all very much for watching, and I will really try to punch out one more video before I embark on another epic California road trip in May.